<laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Annette Insdorf. Uh, I teach film history at Columbia University, but as many of you know, my uh, second home is the 92nd Street Y. And in addition to classic films with Annette Insdorf, the film history classes I've been doing since the pandemic began, I've had the great privilege of moderating real pieces, not remote, but real pieces for over 30 years, bringing some of the greatest film artists of our time into the Y space and now virtually. And I'm being quite honest when I say that Aaron Sorkin is one of the people that I have most wanted to interview, especially with the 92Y audience. So um, a few words of introduction. I will acknowledge that probably many of you have been fans of Aaron Sorkin's work since The West Wing, um, winner of 26 Emmys from 1999 to 2006. For others among you, maybe it was after appreciating the uh, snappy dialogue of his savvy screenplays for films including A Few Good Men, The American President, Charlie Wilson's War, Moneyball, Steve Jobs, or The Social Network for which he won the Academy Award. But to be honest, I became a fervent admirer a bit late in the game. Having missed the West Wing, I discovered and embraced his combination of craft and ethics in a series he created later, namely The Newsroom. About uh, eight years ago, I subscribed to HBO only to watch The Newsroom, finding it the very best that TV had to offer. And if we have time later in this hour, I'll return to that bracing program. But we are here to focus on The Trial of the Chicago 7, which he wrote and directed, and it's currently on Netflix. It's an evocative recreation of the seminal trial that took place just over 50 years ago of the anti-war activists who were accused of conspiring to cause riots at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. It also has an eerily contemporary resonance for our own times of protest and upheaval. The film begins and closes with the chant heard in August 1968 when demonstrators gathered, the whole world's watching. Well, that's even more palpable in 2020 when cell phones can record and transmit all events in real time. I will be asking our esteemed guest a few questions, including clips from the trial of the Chicago 7, and then opening it up to you via the chat box. So, Aaron Sorkin, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks so much for having me, and thank you for that generous introduction. Not at all. Now, I remember watching on TV the approximately 10,000 anti-Vietnam War activists in front of the Democratic Convention and the, what, 23,000 police and National Guard beating them. I was a teenager, but in 1968, you were seven. <laughs> Did you know anything about this trial before Steven Spielberg asked you to write the screenplay 14 years ago? And if not, how did you prepare? I was, it, it, it was uh, 14 years ago, 2006, uh, that Steven Spielberg asked me to come over to his house on a Saturday morning, which I just want to point out is unusual. I, I don't hang out with Steven Spielberg. Uh, but he said he wanted to make a movie about the Chicago 7. And I said, count me in. That sounds like a great idea. That'll be a fantastic movie. And as soon as I left his house, I called my father to ask him who the Chicago 7 were. Um, I, I was just saying yes to doing a movie with Stephen. So I had a lot to learn. Uh, you know, I had a vague sense that there had been some civil unrest at the Democratic Convention in 1968. I had a vague sense that Abby Hoffman was a leader in the counterculture. And I think all I knew about Tom Hayden was that he had been married to Jane Fonda at some point. But that was the extent of, of my understanding of the Chicago 7. There were a dozen or so good books to read, uh, some of them by the defendants themselves, a 21,000 page trial transcript. Uh, but the most critical part of the research was spending time with Tom Hayden. Hayden passed away a few years ago, but he was very much alive uh, when I started working on this. Um, I think we just, are you, your mic is still good? Cause for a second. Yes, it is. I'm sorry. Did that, uh, no. I meant that to sound like the end of an answer. No, 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 no. It's, it's fine. I just, okay. I always get nervous about microphones. And okay. <laughs> now, as you were writing the screenplay or while directing the film, what surprised you most about the trial or its legacy? 
well, the, the, the trial itself was crazy. One of the craziest trials uh, in American history. Um, and there's, there's actually much more circus uh, in the trial than I was even able to show uh, in the film. And like, like the participants in the trial, like the people paying attention to the trial, which was everyone, the whole world was watching. Um, uh, for me, reading the trial transcript, I just couldn't believe this was happening in an American courtroom. Uh, I couldn't believe the decisions uh, that the judge was handing down for the bench, the part played by Frank Langella. Uh, uh, and I couldn't believe the stuff the prosecution was doing. Um, uh, add to that co very colorful defendants like Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin uh, and, and those guys. Add to that the eighth member of the Chicago 7, Bobby Seale, uh, and what happened to him during the trial. Um, uh, I would say that there was very little that didn't surprise me. Okay. Now, your opening sequence, most of my viewers know, if you've taken classes with me, that I consider opening scenes to be crucial in establishing our relationship, not only to the plot, but to the style of the film. You introduce multiple characters, including John Carroll Lynch as David Dellinger, Yaya Abdul-Mateen as Bobby Seale. Uh, Eddie Redmayne is Tom Hayden, and I'll get into a few more in a moment. I want us to all look at a clip because I'm going to ask you a specific question about how that opening sequence works. Sure. So if you could show the clip we have prepared. And when it comes to the war, when it comes to social justice, there is simply not enough of a difference between Hubert Humphrey and Richard Nixon to make a difference. And so we're going to Chicago. Young people, by bus loads, will go to Chicago to show our solidarity and our disgust. But most importantly, to get laid by someone you just met. 536,000 of us sent to a country not, not one of these bumper sticker patriots in Washington could find on a map with a motherfucking map. We're going to Chicago. Anyone who stays in the park, sings what he got through, they're gonna be fine. But the cops, cops gonna be a half inch from losing their fucking minds, because Daly's gonna wind them up to make sure of it. We're going to Chicago peacefully. We're going peacefully. But if we're met there with violence, you better believe that we're gonna meet that violence with nonviolence. Always nonviolence, and that's without exception. What if the police start hitting you? Why would the police start hitting me? What if they do? I'll duck. David, he watches the news. I've organized 100 protests. This one will be no different in that it almost certainly won't work. The police are- I'm not are... worried about the police. I am worried about Hoffman and Rubin. It's the Democratic National Convention, honey. Every camera in America is gonna be pointed at it, and Daly is not gonna let his city turn into a theater of war. And Hoffman and Rubin are geniuses in their own special way. Oh, dear God. He's got a Boy Scout meeting at seven. Dad, if the police- If the police try to arrest me, I'll do what I always do and what I've taught you to do, which is what? Very calmly and very politely. Fuck the motherfuckers up! They leave us alone and everything's cool. They tangle, disrupt, intimidate, they play it fast and loose with the First Amendment. Robert. They start breaking heads, then no, we will not be on our way. You can't give this speech in Chicago. Fred Hampton wants me there. Plane ticket. Let Fred give the speech. Between Hayden and Hoffman, there could be 5,000 people. It'd be nice to talk to 5,000 people. Not while you're in trouble in Connecticut. Yes, while I'm in trouble. I'm the head of the Black Panther. So when the hell am I not gonna be in trouble? Travel bag. You're gonna be in a lot more of it if you stand up and say, fry the pigs. If they attack you, you take them out of context. So will every white person in America. Cops don't give a shit about context, and you don't have enough protection in Chicago. There's no place to be right now but in it. But fry the pigs? If they Dr. attack Dr. King is dead. He has a dream, well now he has a fucking bullet in his head. Martin's dead, Malcolm's dead, Megha's dead, Bobby's dead, Jesus is dead. They tried it peacefully, we gonna try something else. Sandra, I'll be there for four hours, that's it. Snack. You at least gonna take one of these? If I knew how to use that, I wouldn't need to be making speeches. Okay, Whew. Now, in your zippy writing and direction, each new scene picks up a question from the previous scene. Was that montage in your script or was it devised partly during the editing? No, it was uh, absolutely in the script. Um, <clears throat> there, there wasn't much that was devised uh, during editing. There were some things that we knew were gonna, the riot, two riot sequences, uh, we knew those were gonna be built in editing, but we would need to get, you know, bring the ingredients uh, to editing. 
Uh, but that that was all scripted. The opening sequence or the prologue, um, uh, which we were just watching a piece of, uh, was written to do two things. Uh, introduce uh, the main characters uh, in a way that shows that uh, these anti-war protesters weren't all of the same stripe, uh, right? You had Eddie Redmayne and uh, and the SDS, the Students for Democratic Society. Those are the guys with the white short sleeves shirts and uh, and thin ties, uh, uh, the intellectual end of the group. Then you had Abby and Jerry, uh, uh, the yippies. They represented uh, much more of a cultural revolution. Um, then Dave Dellinger with the MOB, or the mobilization to end the war uh, in Vietnam. He was a pacifist, nonviolent, and then you go to Bobby Seale uh, of the Black Panthers, um, <clears throat> who was simply a Second Amendment advocate uh, for uh, African American men and women uh, being threatened by cops. Um, uh, so, like I said, it was I, I wanted to show introduce these uh, the principal characters, uh, show immediately show the contrasts between them. But then the second thing that I wanted to do with this prologue was just set the context for August 1968 and that convention. A nation going off the rails um, with the draft numbers increasing every month, uh, the number of casualties in Vietnam increasing every month, Martin Luther King being shot followed uh, just a couple of months later by Bobby Kennedy being shot and killed. And uh, and, and then the temperature rising uh, on both sides, uh, daily adding more riot police, more National Guard, uh, our guys saying, you know, get ready, the police are going to go crazy, we're going to be peaceful, but it's starting to get hot in Chicago. Um, and uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, I won't spoil how the prologue ends. Uh, but I wanted to accomplish in five minutes and 35 seconds, um, uh, I, I wanted to deliver all that. And I think the MVP of the whole sequence is Daniel Pemberton, uh, our composer, uh, because the note that I gave to him was very broad and very vague. Uh, I just said um, the score needs to be ironic uh, for this section. Don't write it to picture. Don't write about how terrible things are. Um, uh, uh, make it a party with each new character that's introduced. Um, uh, just bring in more percussion, bring in more bass. At one point, I literally said to him, more cowbell. Um, uh, uh, and so, it, anyway, the answer to your question is that was scripted. Yeah, I, and I, I knew that most of it was, but it's partly that rhythm that comes from direction. Uh, someone just now in the chat, Shauna, said that she loves the crisp staccato of your writing and editing, and that's what pulls us through. It's, it's similar to your directorial debut, Molly's Game, where well, the I, sequence moves through that dialogue-rich script is through zippy visuals that are held together by Molly's rapid voiceover narration. Here, there's I, no voiceover. I appreciate that, and I appreciate, I, th I think it was Shauna, uh, was that who just said that? Yeah. Okay, I, good. I, I can't uh, look at all the chats. They're coming in like, you know, 20 per minute, but I glance and sometimes get one or two that make sense at that moment. <laughs> I appreciate any time a musical term like staccato uh, is used to describe anything I've written. Yep. <laughs> now, one of the trademarks of your style can be seen in Bobby Seale's walk and talk. Um, now he co-founded the Black Panthers as I hope everybody knows with Huey Newton in 1966, later ran for mayor of Oakland. That walk and talk is in a single unbroken tracking shot. I'm curious, how many takes do you need to do for that kind of movement? That particular uh, one, I think, uh, I, I remember very, the, the night very well when we were shooting that. I think we got in about eight or nine uh, takes. Um, it's uh, the choreography can be a little bit hard. Uh, it's you, you have a, a third actor in that scene, really, who's the steady cam operator. Um, and his choreography needs to be worked out perfectly. Um, but one of the reasons I remember that night so well uh, is because Yaya Abdul Mateen, uh, who plays Bobby, uh, who is a great actor uh, and a great guy. I just remember him being in uh, such an upbeat mood that night, high-fiving people and joking around, really being the, the field captain on the set. 
And I turned to the script supervisor and remarked that, um, uh, God, Yaya is so uh, upbeat tonight. And she pointed out that this was the only scene in the movie where he was free. Um, uh, in every other scene in the film, uh, he's being shoved into a chair, shackled, bound, gagged uh, uh, in a prison cell. It's the only scene in the movie where he's a free man. Absolutely. And by the way, uh, I just noticed a great remark from Holly. The walk and talk combined with the pitch and rhythm of your dialogue is what sets you apart. And somebody also wrote... Uh, pitch, rhythm, Holly, you're finding your way to my heart. And guess what? We have one more. Ariane says, you are a musician. <laughs> oh, Ariane, that's, uh, I, I really do appreciate that. You know, my, um, my parents started, to, I, I grew up in the East, uh, and uh, my parents started taking me to see plays starting from when I was very little, for no particular reason other than they had a theater going habit when, when they were young, uh, and theater was affordable for, uh, you know, for a a school teacher and a, and a young lawyer. Um, they started taking me to see plays and oftentimes they were plays that I wasn't old enough to understand, like uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf when I was nine years old. So I didn't, I loved the theater. I loved when they took me to see plays. Uh, theaters were like cathedrals for me. Um, but sometimes I didn't understand what was going on up there. But what I loved was the sound of dialogue. I loved the sound of great actors and actresses and this language crashing into itself. And um, uh, it sounded like music to me. And so I wanted to imitate that sound. Yeah, and Ariane, who you appreciate already just added, and you slip Gilbert and Sullivan in whenever you get the chance, don't you? <laughs> yeah, that, that's <laughs> I do, Ariane. <laughs> I do. I like Gilbert and Sullivan, number one. Uh, number two, they, uh, on the West Wing, where there there were a few Gilbert and Sullivan references on the West Wing, um, I couldn't on the West Wing make any pop cultural references because we were in it, because it was a parallel universe. You don't want to ask the audience to start doing mental math. Uh, for instance, I mean the, the, the show premiered in 1999. It was not from 99 to 2006. So if if somebody referenced Britney Spears uh, on the show. In a world where Britney Spears has the number one signal, uh, George W. Bush is the president. Um, you, your mind just automatically starts thinking that way. So I never made any contemporary references. And that is why the references were things like Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> it that and Gilbert and Sullivan are awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, back to the trial of the Chicago 7. Sure. <laughs> Although I love some of these chat comments. Your film has 11 major characters. Yes. And I, I love ensemble pieces that convey interdependence rather than celebrating a sole hero. Um, films like uh, The Right Stuff, Philip Kaufman, mm -hmm. mid 80s. It presents individuals who exist primarily in terms of a larger community. And when there's a collective protagonist, the resolution emerges from group dynamics in a way that acknowledges the insufficiency of a single hero. So first, when you write the script, do you speak the lines out loud to differentiate how each of the many characters will sound? Well, I speak all the lines out loud. I'm very physical uh, when I'm writing. I play all the parts. I'm jumping up and down from my desk. I'm walking around. Sometimes I'll find myself like two streets away from my office because that, that's where I walk to. I once broke my nose writing. Uh, I was getting into it uh, so much. Um, but it's not to make sure that they're sounding different. Um, I, I don't really differentiate characters by the way they speak. Uh, I, I differentiate characters by what they want and how they overcome whatever obstacle I've put in their way. Um, it's about intention and obstacle uh, for me. What does this character want? What are the tactics that he or she is going to employ to overcome uh, of the obstacle once they get there, um, and then what happens when they either succeed or fail uh, at overcoming that obstacle. I have tried uh, from time to time to write in another, in a different voice. Um, like, I know you don't like it when we veer off from Chicago. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, but no, when, like, when, like when it came it. time to start writing the social network, after months and months and months of research and then another few months of just kind of climbing the walls, 
uh, and trying to figure out, uh, okay, it's not about research anymore. It's about thinking of what, what's this movie about? What's it going to look like? Uh, uh, that kind of thing. I had the first, I had the first and second scene uh, in, in my head. Um, uh, and it came time to sit down and, and write fade in. It came down to time to write a scene, which is between two college kids at a college bar uh, having a bad date. Uh, okay. And I sat down to write it and I realized, wow, you know, these, these are the youngest characters uh, I've ever written. These are college kids. Uh, I, I, I better sound like a college kid uh, when I'm writing this. And I like for a day agonized over a half a page or something. said, this is ridiculous. First of all, there isn't a way that college kids sound right. Uh, there are millions uh, of college kids, and I'm assuming they sound as different as everybody else sounds. Second of all, I'm just a bad, I'm bad at impressions. Uh, I, I don't know how to write like someone else. I can only write like myself. And that, that's not to say I make characters sound like me. I'm, I'm not, my characters are considerably more articulate than I am. I'm not sure your audience is getting that impression right now. Um, uh, but uh that's a long way of saying, yes, I do say all the lines out loud, but it's not to make sure that everybody sounds different. And although this is an ensemble piece, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, did you feel that there might be a central protagonist? I mean, I know this is more what Spielberg might have done had he directed this originally. Like, you know, did you find yourself identifying more with, say, Tom Hayden than with Abby Hoffman? I... Uh... Yes, standing outside of it before I started writing it. Again, you've done all the research and, and, and you've done all the pacing around and now it's time to do the thing that actually looks like writing. Um, I would say that, yes, I identified with Hayden more than Abby. Um, and I thought that Hayden was right more than I thought that Abby was right. But just because I can't imitate Abby's uh, speaking voice doesn't mean that I cannot empathize with uh, uh, this man's position, and uh, I, I don't judge him when I'm writing. I'm, I'm defending him uh, when I'm writing. So there is uh, a final face-off between these two characters, right? It's the penultimate scene uh, of the film, and uh, I can, you know, I can put real blood into both the arguments uh, that that they were making. Okay. And at what point did you decide to focus on the tension within the group of defendants, the very sort of proper Tom versus the anarchic Adam right. and Jerry Rubin? And that was the invaluable value of the time I spent with Hayden. It was the one thing that I couldn't get. The, the story for me, the film organized itself into three stories that I was going to tell at once. The courtroom drama, uh, the evolution of the riot, how did what was supposed to be a peaceful demonstration turn into such a violent clash with the police? And the third was the more personal story between Tom and Abby, two guys uh, who are on the same side, they want the same thing, but they clearly can't stand each other. And they each think that the other one is, is harming the cause. That I got from Hayden and would have only been able to get from Hayden. And by the way, the other thing I got from Hayden, and I, I'll I don't want to be cute or coy, but I'll say this in a way that isn't a spoiler for any viewers who haven't seen the film. What I got from Hayden, that is not in the books, it's not in the trial transcript, O-U-R, our. Okay. That was a pretty big deal, right? Um, yep. Bill Goldman, William Goldman, who's a, a hero to a, a lot of us, and I'm sure uh, to you and to your students, talks about in Adventures on the Screen Trade, he talks about having a secret. And when he was researching Butch and Sundance, and he found out the Sundance kid couldn't swim. <laughs> um, and he had that in his pocket. It was such a gift uh, to a screenwriter. That's how I felt about OUR. I cannot wait until I get to this. Okay. Now, given that the trial lasted over 150 days, I'm curious, how long was your first draft of the script? And how many more drafts were there? Okay, I um, I don't think I have a reputation as being an economical writer. <laughs> uh, the first draft was, uh, 
it was over 200 pages, but was not my longest screenplay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was not my longest first draft, but it was over 200 pages. So clearly um, some trimming had to happen, but that's okay because uh, what I preach is, is this, um, and you may preach something different. Uh, get when you're writing the first draft, get to the end. Um, uh, don't keep going back to the beginning and start up, starting over again. Get to fade out, and you will have learned a lot about the thing that you're writing. You'll have learned what you need, what you don't need anymore, uh, uh, what you need to underline and hang a light on uh, uh, now, what you need to set up better in the first act so that it can fully pay off in the third, that kind of thing. So it's okay if your first draft is very long. Don't try to shame me for that. Oh, I'm the last person in the world to shame. When I have my students write papers, I'm, I'm granting they're not screenplays, but I tell them revision is the most important thing. It's the rewrite, not the yes. first draft. So I believe in refining as opposed to saying it's done. Um, exactly right. You know, for me, uh, whether it's a screenplay or a play or an episode of television, it's not finished, it's confiscated. Uh, uh, someone comes in and says, pencils down, we, you're, you're done, we have to do this now. Right. Now, when the film initially didn't get financing, I gather you tried writing it as a play. And one of the questions that came in uh, from Megan was, might there be a stage version, a play version of The Trial of the Chicago 7, do you think? Listen, I've said this a couple of times. And I get laughed at, but I'm 100% serious. I think it would make a great musical. <laughs> See what happened? <laughs> Thank you for laughing right in my face when I said No, it. I'm <laughs> laughing. I'm laughing with pleasure, not mockery. Pleasure. It, come on. It would I make agree. a no, great, with a contemporary score. Uh, yeah. Look, I, to be honest with you. Um, you have, not just in this film, shown how well you understand the overlap between a courtroom and a theater. And what you have in Trial of the Chicago 7, it was a show trial with the Yippies performing their antics in the courtroom. Right. And I can imagine, I can imagine Sasha Baron Cohen doing a terrific musical number. <laughs> uh, just imagine, you know, listen, you started this off by talking about the prologue, right? And the introductions of those characters. That prologue is an opening number, okay? It's an opening number where nobody sings, uh, but it's scored wall to wall and it's it's written as an opening number. It's It feels like an opening number. I'll show you all. Uh, listen, I'm just jotting down some of the comments that are coming in. Oh, they, they love this. Uh, Carol says, if Hamilton could become a musical, okay. why not this? Who, it, it was that Carol who said that? Yeah. I, they're, okay, they're, Carol, I was just gonna say, that they believe me, they laughed at Lynn when he walked in with a thick biography of Alexander Hamilton under his arm and said, I think this would make a great musical. Yep, and Carol just added, Nathan Lane is Judge Hoffman. There you go. <laughs> That's good, that works. Um, and someone else wrote that either Lynn manuel Miranda should write the music with you or Adam Gettle. I, I appreciate Adam Gettle's work a great deal. So Okay, you know. well, I appreciate him, I'll bet, even more uh, than you do because Adam Gettle wrote the, uh, it's it's incidental score, but it's incidental is, it, is reductive. He wrote the original score for To Kill a Mockingbird uh, on Broadway. It was nominated for a Tony for it, in fact, uh, uh, for best score. Uh, so I there is no bigger Adam Gettle fan than me. By the way, I have to share with you one of the chats that just came in. Hugh Jackman is with us this evening um, and he's writing, let me know when it's finished, Aaron. So oh. he's got a musical version. <laughs> okay, uh, Hugh, obviously you're on. Um, <laughs> I, we may I, have I will. A good fit of here, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, now another question that came in that I think is- He says good. he's happy to audition. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, Jay, Broadbar is, Jay Broadbar is asking, how much of your dialogue is verbatim from trial transcripts? Uh, actual trials aren't nearly as entertaining as the ones that uh, we're used to seeing in the movies. Um, so very little of the dialogue is, um, is verbatim. What is verbatim? Uh, 
most of uh, most of the judge's dialogue, uh, uh, most of his reactions to objections uh, and so forth are verbatim, and every word of uh, any exchange with Bobby is verbatim. I just felt like that was kind of sacred territory, and I didn't want to mess with it. Okay, and, but like for example, Schultz calls the defendants the radical left, which mm -hmm. sounds like today's rhetoric. <sighs> Not always in the script. I, I've been asked a few times uh, if I uh, if the script changed to reflect events uh, in the world, the answer is no. Uh, uh, events change to reflect the script in many, many ways. Look, uh, we thought the film was plenty relevant when we were making it last winter. Uh, we had a president um, who at his rallies was getting nostalgic about the old days where they'd carry that guy out of here on a stretcher and beat the crap out of him and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then we made the film and suddenly, I think it was May, uh, that George Floyd was killed and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery. And uh, suddenly there were again, violent clashes between protesters and police, tear gas, nightsticks, um, and a demonization of, uh, of protest. Uh, so again, what happened was that we were just on a 14 year crash course with, uh, with events. Uh, so no, I, the answer is I did not, that line has been in the script for years. Bobby, can you breathe? Has been in the script for years. Uh, Um, okay, so I'm going to ask about casting because a lot of the questions have been in that line. Now, mm -hmm. um, we could also say that the circus-like ambience of that trial was due to the egregiously imperious judge, Julius Hoffman. Uh, he happened to be five foot six, if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, you cast Frank Langella, who I think is superb. Um, talk about the casting of him as Hoffman and then we're going to, as the judge Hoffman, and then we're going to get into some of the others. Sure. Yes. Just to be clear, as the judge is in the movie, Judge Hoffman, Abby Hoffman are not related. Um, uh, the real Julius Hoffman, as you pointed out, he was a um, diminutive uh, uh, guy. That wasn't as important to me. A physical resemblance to the character uh, wasn't as important to me as just First of all, just a great actor. Uh, you know, if you if you start with that, if you start with a great actor, good things will happen. Uh, what you needed from Judge Hoffman was a sense of he is the last guardian of the America uh, the way it used to be, or we imagine the way it used to be. Um, and you people um, will, you know, will, will not overtake us. Um, and, uh, it, you know, in Frank, you get an enormous amount of power. Uh, but like I said, mostly what you get is a world-class actor. Yes. And I just want to also mention, cause it's a small part, but I love that you cast as Fred Hampton, Kelvin Harrison Jr., who I have so admired in Loose and in Waves. I mean, this is really one of the up and coming great actors. He is, uh, uh, he's a great actor. You're going to see a lot more of Kelvin. Um, and happily, you're going to see more of the Fred Hampton uh, story, which we just brush up against uh, in this movie. But uh, either later this year or early next year, I'm not sure when, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, uh, uh, which is the story of how Fred was set up, how the Panthers were infiltrated, and the night that he was killed. Absolutely. Now, a lot of the questions are about the casting of Sasha Baron Cohen, but I'm going to make a slightly wider question from this. You cast quite a few Brits. I mean, Mark Rylance as William Kunstler, Eddie Redmayne as Tom Hayden, Alex Sharp, a smaller part, obviously, playing. Yeah. Uh, and he won the Tony for the Curious Incident. He sure did. Um, could you yeah, no Australians, though, you'll notice. Not yet. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, could you talk a little oh, bit about he got to that really fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was noticing this. Okay. Um, 
talk just a little bit about it. And um, I, I know the story, but not everybody does, that Sasha Baron Cohen was the first one cast back in 2007. Yeah. Uh, first of all, um, uh, American, British, Australia, New Zealand does not matter to me. Uh, uh, a great actor is a great actor. Um, uh, and, uh, and Hugh is certainly uh, a great actor. Um, as are Mark, Sasha, Alex. Um, I'm, I'm missing one of the Brits, I know. Uh, yes, Sasha, uh, Stephen uh, cast Sasha. Uh, back in 2007 and as soon as Sasha heard that the the, the gears were working themselves up uh, again he got in touch with me to let me know under no circumstances would I be considering another actor for the role the role was his he never gave it up it was offered to him uh, it's his that that part's taken you can stop the casting search there great so I did and by the way um, I, I know that he wrote his thesis about Jewish activists during the civil rights. Can you believe it? Yeah, um, uh, about uh, Jewish activists and and how uh, Jews in the civil rights movement, how that world intersected with the Black civil rights movement. Uh, so he has been studying Abby for a long time, which is amazing to me. And by the way, I remember watching Sasha Baron Cohen less than a year ago in the Netflix miniseries The Spy where he was terrific as Mossad spy Ellie Cohen. It was based on a true story. No one should be surprised anymore that uh, Sasha's a great actor. Uh, you know, we were introduced to him as a clown, an incredibly sophisticated clown. I, 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 I don't mean clown to be, um, not as an insult. I mean, that was his vocation. Uh, and uh, uh, he is, he just happens to be an excellent actor. Uh, he's an excellent actor who just happens to be uh, have this gift for improvisation and uh, uh, creating these wild characters and getting you to say silly things. Yeah. Now, we're about to see a clip with uh, Sasha Baron Cohen as Abby Hoffman, but I do have this question. I mean, how do you direct a political performance artist who's such a consummate improviser? Did you have to calibrate the performance of an actor playing an activist who used theatrics on stage and off? I mean, did you have to ever ask him to take it down a notch? Well, you know, Sasha understood uh, before we started, because we talked plenty before we started, um, that this wasn't gonna be someplace where his considerable skills as an improviser were going to be needed at all. Uh, uh, that he was, you know, he was doing a scripted uh, film. Um, that was that was just fine with him, um, uh, and I'll tell you, his. I, I think you're about to show a scene from him on the witness stand, uh, right? Yep. Uh, that was that was really his first big day uh, on the shooting schedule. Uh, uh, we, we, it was probably the end of week two or the beginning of week three, uh, but up until then, um, it, it had mostly been him marching down the street uh, and chanting. And with a wisecrack uh, on now and then. And I could just tell everybody in the crew, everybody in the cast was kind of nervous leading up to this one day uh, when Sasha was going to have to do this very serious scene, sitting still with none of the stuff that we usually see uh, Sasha rely on. And everybody knew how important a scene it was. It's our big uh, uh, courtroom climax. Well, well I, I don't remember having to say more than five words to him uh, in terms of directing that thing. I mean, beyond you're doing great. Uh, uh, you know, you want to do it again? You're doing great. All right, let's take a look at that scene. I know that almost this entire audience has already seen Trial of the Chicago 7, but let's just uh, have, we're going to run the clip of Abby Hoffman on the stand. Sure. For the record, please. It's Abby. Last name. My grandfather's name was Shaboysnikov, but he was a Russian Jew protesting anti-Semitism, so he was assigned a name that would sound like yours. What is your date of birth? Psychologically, 1960. What were you doing until 1960? Nothing. I believe it's called an American education. Why don't we just proceed with the testimony? Sure. Abby, do you know why you're on trial here? We carried certain ideas across state lines. 
Not machine guns or drugs or little girls, ideas. When we crossed from New York to New Jersey to Pennsylvania to Ohio to Illinois, we had certain ideas. And for that, we were gassed, beaten, arrested, and put on trial. Okay. In 1861, Lincoln said in his inaugural address, when the people shall grow weary of their constitutional right to amend their government, they shall exert their revolutionary right to dismember and overthrow that government. And if Lincoln had given that speech in Lincoln Park last summer, he'd be put on trial with the rest of us. So how do you overthrow or dismember, as you say, your government peacefully? In this country, we do it every four years. So I, how many takes did you do of that? I'm curious. Uh, I, I can't remember uh, because in a scene like that also, there are a, a lot of setups. Um, uh, it's not just the camera on, you know, one camera on Abby and then turn around and have a camera on um, Mark Rylance. Uh, uh, right, there are going to be, first of all, different sizes uh, on both of them, uh, but we're going to get coverage of the other defendants, we're going to get coverage of the prosecutors, we're going to get coverage of the jurors, the judge, uh, uh, the people in the crowd. Uh, so uh, a scene like that, which the bulk of it actually comes after uh, uh, where you cut off, uh, it takes a little while to shoot, but you know, no one, no one stood down. Um, uh, everybody, you've been talking about how it's an ensemble, and yes, it's an ensemble made up largely of people who are used to starring uh, in their own movies. And I was very moved by uh, how much they were there for each other on days when it wasn't their big day. Um, and people are responding <laughs> very positively to the scene as well as the rest of oh, the Oh, thanks. And a related question, Ross was asking, does your screenplay include the details, for example, of camera angles? I know we're, we're, ta we're taught in screenwriting classes not to put that in, but do you do that, whether it's for your film that you're directing or for someone else? I don't, uh, unless it's necessary to uh, listen when I'm writing a screenplay uh, I'm very aware that I'm what I'm writing isn't meant to be read it's meant to be performed um, uh, however somebody has to read it uh, uh, first so if I'm trying to get Hugh Grant uh, uh, to play I'm sorry Hugh Jackman um, <laughs> sorry Hugh. if I'm trying to get Hugh Jackman uh, to play a part in the movie um, uh, the first thing he's got to do is read the script. Uh, so if it's a camera move that I need to describe to communicate uh, something to him, like we push in slowly on the gun as he, uh, uh, that kind of thing, then I'll say so. Otherwise, there would be nothing in that scene uh, that you just saw where I would indicate any, uh, there would be any camera indication at all. Um, that's something I would rather, if, if I'm directing the movie, it's something I'd rather collaborate with the DP. Um, okay. And um, it's not just this film, but also A Few Good Men that shows how well you understand the dramatics of trials. Did you watch trial films like 12 Angry Men, let's say, either in preparation for Trial of the Chicago 7 or earlier on, or are there other films that were touchstones for you in that sense? Well, 12 Angry Men is a big one uh, uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's funny, 12 Angry Men is considered one of the greatest courtroom dramas, but they're, they're, we're never in a courtroom uh, in that movie. Uh, we are incredibly in just one room uh, in, in that movie. Uh, and uh, so it appeals to me for a number of reasons, in, including that uh, they, say, they say that when you, uh, when you bring home a new puppy, uh, you should get a crate that's just big enough for the dog to be able to turn around in, but no bigger because they really like the sense of security um, uh, that, that that tight space brings. That's kind of how I am uh, as a writer and, uh, and now a writer director. I would much rather be in a room with four walls uh, uh, once I'm outside, even writing. I just kind of uh, I'll lose my bearings. So I've watched a lot of courtroom dramas growing up and I watch them over and over, whether it's 12 Angry Men or Inherit the Wind or The Verdict, um, uh, the Kane Mutiny, 
um, uh, and then the play version, which is the Kane Mutiny Court Martial. Uh, and there are, uh, just like there are rules to music and rules to drama, there are certain courtroom drama rules. Uh, and I came right smack up against one of them uh, ch shooting the, the trial scenes in this movie because Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman, those characters felt that it was their job every day to demonstrate to the judge that they have no respect for this trial, no respect for these proceedings. And Sasha and Jeremy knew that and wanted to play that. I, on the other hand, know uh, that if it appears as if one of the sides in a courtroom drama doesn't care whether they win or lose, you're not going to have any tension in the courtroom uh, drama anymore. Um, so I would go to them and explain my problem to them. And they would say, that sounds completely reasonable, but it kind of sounds like a director's problem. Uh, you got to have to figure that out. So we all figured it out together. And I'm also taking a guess, but this is more based on the newsroom and Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, that Patty Chayefsky is a screenwriter whose work you have admired. I mean, this is the guy right. who wrote that work. <laughs> uh, but also he wrote The Hospital, The Americanization of Emily, Marty. I mean, is that Marty. one of... Yes, of course. Um, uh, of course. It, listen, if you're, if you're a screenwriter, chances are one of the reasons you're a screenwriter is because of network. Um, uh, and another reason is William Goldman. Uh, beyond that, uh, Patty Chayefsky uh, lived a life uh, that I admire. Uh, I, I really admire his work. He also, you know, in the early days of, he was a Playhouse 90 guy uh, uh, in the early days of television. He was a creature of the theater. Uh, uh, and he was a tremendous screenwriter who wrote movies that were, uh, full of fantastic language. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could talk about Patty Chayefsky a lot longer, Me but too. we're going <laughs> to move on. Um, a few of the questions were about Michael Keaton. A mm -hmm. surprise. I mean, when I watched the film a few weeks ago, and when he, sh I didn't know who was in the movie at that point. And as Attorney General Ramsey Clark, he was really excellent. No surprise there. Um, but I'm going to ask, uh, maybe we'll take a quick look at the clip and you know why you felt that it was important to include Clark's exchange with Judge Hoffman, given that out of necessity you had to omit certain figures and moments. Mm -hmm. So that'll be our last clip, if we can go to that now. State your name. William Ramsey Clark. Do you swear the testimony you give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Clark. What was your occupation in the summer of 1968? I was the Attorney General of the United States. You were appointed by President Johnson. Yes. And confirmed by the United States Senate. Yes. Now, did you receive a phone call at your office at 11.50 a.m. on September 10th? I think that was supposed to keep going. Did it just suddenly stop? Oh, it definitely is supposed to keep going. Um, uh, well, no. that's okay. We can talk about the scene. Okay, um, I mean, I, I found- What it happens is, um, uh, just, God, cover your ears if this is gonna be a spoiler, but uh, um, Ramsey Clark, the former attorney general, gives exculpatory testimony, uh, uh, evident testimony of innocence of these guys. Um, and he does it, the, the judge won't let the jury hear the testimony uh, and throws it all out. Uh, you asked me why I wanted to include uh, Ramsey Clark and all that. It's because I wanted a moment that we could identify that if I drama dramatized it uh, right or well, uh, that we could identify as that's when they lost. That was uh, uh, that was the last trick uh, up their sleeve, um, and they're going to lose. And that seemed. I also thought it was worth just including the information that Ramsey Clark's Justice Department said these guys were innocent. Um, as far as Michael Keaton's casting goes, 
Uh, Michael had actually wanted to play Kunstler, but uh, uh, the dates didn't work out. So sadly, we had to settle for Mark Rylance uh, in the part. Uh, but Keaton said, hey, do you have anyone uh, do you cast as Ramsey Clark uh, yet? And we said, no, you want to play Ramsey Clark? It's two days. Uh, and he said, sure. So that's how that happened. And, I, and it really works so well. I mean, I, Keaton, I think, is superb, whether it's Birdman or, you know, so many. I other agree things. with you. Yeah. I agree. Um, at, on, on a larger scale, in terms of what you were directing of the big scenes, you create these montage sequences that intertwine black and white and color footage. I'm mean, sorry, well, black and white archival footage with color recreation, like the police tear gassing the protesters yeah. and the nighttime ride in Grant Park. Um, and, and since I always teach the unbearable lightness of being in my Columbia classes, another wonderful Philip Kaufman film, I was wondering if that might have been a model for how to use that kind of counterpoint footage, or are there other things that you saw of this kind that helped it, you? Well, I, I know unbearable lightness of being well, and I'm, and I'm sure it has uh, seeped into my bloodstream. Um, the reason why, the principal reason why it took the film 14 years to get made uh, were the, was the fact that the riots were budget busters. A film like this has to be able to fit into a budget that is proportional to what the studio feels is going to be the audience appetite uh, for something like this. In other words, um, it's it, it's 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 not an adventurous uh, a film. It doesn't have that kind of uh, budget. And uh, when it finally came time to make the film, uh, Stephen had decided the time to make Steven Spielberg had decided the time to make the film uh, uh, is now. Uh, and I had directed Molly's Game. I directed my first film, and Stephen was sufficiently pleased with that that he thought I should direct uh, Chicago 7, and he said, and now the riots are your problem. <laughs> <laughs> the, the way we were going to do the riots, and you always want to, if you're doing something out of a budgetary necessity, you always want to make sure that it looks like that's what you would have done if you'd had an unlimited budget. Uh, and, and I think that we uh, achieved that by being able to shoot in Chicago. Uh, we shot those, all those Chicago scenes are shot in Chicago in Grant Park uh, and Michigan Avenue where they took place and nothing much has changed there. We had hundreds of hours of archival footage, uh, of news footage. And uh, with our DP, Faden Papa Michael and our editor, uh, Alan Baumgarten, we just found the right recipe of we're going to use a few. Uh, first of all, the the ultimate riot in reality it started in the afternoon and and lasted into the evening. I put the whole thing at night uh, because I needed the cover of darkness uh, to do some of the stuff that I was going to do. With the I hate to be glib about it, but with the help of smoke from tear gas um, uh, and night and shooting light through that smoke and silhouette, uh, we were able to get a few wide shots uh, and create the illusion of. Uh, of a lot of size. And then I was just gonna get a whole bunch of very tight shots uh, of the eyes right before a baton uh, a smacks in of, of blood coming down the side of someone's cheek of a tear gas canister uh, uh, being loaded in. And we would take the original footage, those wide shots, the many, many extreme close-ups uh, um, and the hundreds of hours of uh, archival footage which we would never try to pretend was original footage. We'd always desaturate it and make sure it was black and white. Uh, and uh, like I said, between Faden and Alan, um, uh, and every once in a while a note from me, um, uh, we, uh, we made it work. You most certainly did. And by the way, um, I, I don't remember if either of us mentioned a few minutes ago To Kill a Mockingbird as a seminal preparatory film for trial partners, <laughs> but Anu, Anu definitely brought it up in the chats. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, yes, go ahead. So I read an interview that you did in 2012 for Vulture with Mark Harris, he, who happens to be my former student. And uh, you said he did well. About, he did well, but you said about the newsroom that the real theme of the show is Don Quixote, which you hear about in every episode and not just Don Quixote, there isn't an episode in which there isn't a reference to a musical, Man of La Mancha and Camelot and Brigadoon. 
Well, um, my question, and it was raised by one person in the chat, might you direct a musical besides Trial of the Chicago 7? Might you direct a musical? I love musicals. Uh, I absolutely love musicals. In fact, my college degree, I have a BFA in musical theater. It's, it's strictly speaking, a musical is the only thing I've been educated uh, to do. But I think, uh, first of all, I wouldn't direct something on stage. Uh, that's a, a, a skill set that other people have. And I love working with talented stage directors. Uh, but I think in terms of directing a musical, uh, I, I do also think that's a skill set that I don't have. Um, uh, so I, uh, I'd love to write one, um, and have Damien Giselle or Rob Marshall, or, you know, one of the guys who's great at it, uh, uh, direct it. I'm sorry. Tom Hooper, Tom Hooper, direct a little musical called Les Mis. Uh, Ross just put into the chat. How's this? The Social Network to the Musical written by Aaron Sorkin, directed by David Fincher, starring Hugh Jackman. Okay. It's perfect. Uh, but can I be there when you suggest it to Fincher? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> no, that's a winner. Yes. Uh, well, actually, I have. There are so many great questions that came in from the chat, and I also have one. And Jen says that we need to wrap up in about two minutes. <laughs> so, then I'm not going to ask my slightly long question. I will instead uh, go to a really nice one from Becky Warshaw. Uh, who, after praising you no end, asks, did you, did you ghostwrite the Biden speech? If not, his speechwriter stole from you. <laughs> um, hey, Becky, uh, uh, how you doing? Um, and uh, I'm very flattered by the comparison, thanks. <laughs> um, but um, even more, there was a, uh, uh, an article in the Washington Post today uh, talking about how um, Biden is entering kind of like Atticus. Uh, Atticus Finch and, and, and to call Mockingbird. And I like thinking of them that way. Hmm. Great. And the last question comes from somebody whose name seems to be art student. He's an art student, I, or she is. Cool I um, what have you learned about writing from directing? That, that's a great question. Um, I, I can, this is something I think I've learned about my own writing, uh, but maybe it, it applies to other people. Um, and it's going to sound like a tiny thing, uh, but it's not. Uh, when you write something, see what happens, uh, just as an experiment, see what happens when you cut the last line of it. Um, uh, I have found that so often uh, I write a scene one line longer than uh, it should be. And um, it's something I only discovered by being able to say to an editor, hey, let's try cutting out a line early. Hmm. I know you were expecting a, a sort of larger answer than that. Um, and if I had more time to think, I, I probably would have a better answer than just something having to do with editing. Uh, but no, I want you to know that I'm, I'm a work in progress. Okay. I am the little acorn that becomes the oak. Give me a chance. I'm nothing if not potential. <laughs> um, the responses that have been coming in throughout, which I mean, I can't even follow most of them. We have about 700 people and many of them are writing. We obviously could spend at least one more hour and we still would not have scratched the surface of what makes the trial of the Chicago 7 so good and what has made pretty much everything you've touched so resonant and so meaningful. So I'm just going to say that this has been a gift to at least have an introduction to the world of Aaron Sorkin. And I sincerely hope that we have the opportunity to talk to you again, because I assure you that there were dozens upon dozens of questions that should have been asked, but didn't get asked. It would be my pleasure. Um, I had a lot of fun doing this and thanks everyone um, uh, who came. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Oh, well, we do too. And I had no expectations for special answers that you're supposed to give. <laughs> I, one of the great things about being an educator is that I learned so much from my students and from my guests. And it just enhances my understanding as, as it does enhance the understanding of all of us. Good Wonderful. luck with the trial of the Chicago 7. Appreciate thank it. You for making it and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Take it easy, Hugh. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <Good night, everybody. laughs>